Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, I speak with Dr. Elizabeth Meacham, author of Earth Spirit Dreaming. Elizabeth discusses her practice of shamanic ecotherapy, the value of doing nothing in nature, the creation of thought forms or what Jung called the spirit of our times, developing a relationship with nature beings, and the importance of relating to the earth through ritual and ceremony. We also discuss the struggle and frustration with language in identifying and describing a spiritual relationship with the earth. Dr. Elizabeth Meacham, author of Earth Spirit Dreaming, Shamanic Ecotherapy Practices, is the originator of the cross-disciplinary practice of shamanic ecotherapy, which she teaches nationally and internationally in workshops, retreats, and training programs. She is the founder of the Lake Erie Institute for Holistic Environmental Education, based in Cleveland, Ohio. Her workshops and training programs offer initiatory experiences that reflect her long-term engagement as a student of the earth and cosmos. Dr. Meacham received her PhD in philosophy, cosmology, and consciousness from the California Institute of Integral Studies and her MA in philosophy from Cleveland State University, and she graduated summa cum laude. She publishes in the areas of creativity, spiritual ecology, sustainability, eco-psychology, and shamanic practices. From 2010 to 2016, She taught in the Departments of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Ursuline College in Pepper Pike, Ohio. Her courses included environmental philosophy, eco-justice, eco-psychology, bioethics, and topics in sustainability. During her time at Ursuline, she co-created an undergraduate degree in sustainability and social justice and created an online graduate certificate in sustainability and spirituality. Elizabeth, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you. Yes, thank I'm you happy for to being be here. here. Well, thank you for being here. I'm looking forward to uh, having this conversation. Uh, we both graduated from the same doctoral program, although yes, our did. paths did not cross mm-hmm. um, at that time. Maybe at one of the retreats at some point they did, but um, I think you graduated the year I started. Yes, um, yeah. 2011. Yeah, yeah. We passed in the night. Yeah, for sure. For yeah. sure. So I think the first question I want to ask you is what is shamanic ecotherapy? My idea of what that is, is evolving over time <laughs> a lot. Okay. Um, it, it first started for me because my, what I think of retroactively as my shamanic awakening happened through eco-psychology practices. And I was very uh, a follower of Thomas Berry, of course, coming from CIIS and Joanna Macy. And I did a lot of earth-based practices. Um, And then when I was teaching, I really was in environmental philosophy, but in the CIIS kind of way. Mm -hmm. You and I know that language. I don't need to go into too much, but really in visionary environmental philosophy, those that really sense us spiritual and sacred aspect to environmental thought. You know exactly what I mean. Yeah. Well, uh, you might want to say a little bit for the listeners who may not know, um, because I don't assume that they're um, all that familiar with CIS. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, So I think a visionary, just as I said, there's, there's, I don't want to go into the whole history of environmental ethics and environmental philosophy, which I could do on another show. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No, you right now. Yeah. Yeah. But as we know, because of where we went to school uh, for our PhDs, philosophy in general really broke away from any sort of spirituality since the era of, era of Descartes. And environmental philosophies, in part, grown up inside of the analytic and phenomenological traditions. And then some thinkers that we know and have read, I assume you encountered Thomas Berry and Joanna Macy as well mm-hmm. as I did, and then so many others around that, and I won't name all the names right now, really what we think of as a participatory worldview or an ecological worldview, and so many thinkers are part of that. And to me, what they do is, in the tradition of German idealism, bring back this aspect of spirituality and the sacred. And I did my doctoral work, my dissertation on transcendentalism, 
And I was very interested in how the environmental movement and environmental thought grew up. And then there was this aspect of bringing back in the sacred. So to me, visionary environmental thinkers are people that are steeped in philosophy. They may be steeped in psychology. Uh, Thomas Berry was a theologian and a historian. Um, And they bring all of these things together, but they really understand our relationship with the earth and the ideas that we use to come back to uh, mutually, to use Thomas Berry's words, mutually enhancing relationship with the earth. They add an element of, of experiencing and seeing the earth as sacred. And this has guided my study and my personal spiritual practice and my teaching for almost 30 years. Yeah, wonderful. Um, yeah, I did some research. Um, uh, on, well, I did quite a bit of research on the history of environmentalism in the United States and um, how it really emerged out of the transcendental movement. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the way I often think about this is I see it as inherently religious. I, I prefer the term spiritual, spiritual, but I see it as being inherently religious in the etymology of religion, which is to reconnect or to rebind. And so I'm like, you know, we have to do that with the earth, with the earth community. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I always see it as, you know, kind of inherently religious, but I think spiritual is a better term to use. Um, I think it's more understood now. Yeah. yeah. And it, it, and I think later we'll get into more conversation about language that we're using. But what I love about what you're doing there is that we're reclaiming some of the nomenclature mm-hmm. uh, from, from we have in our own history times of just great sacred relationship, our own Western history uh, with the earth. And I think it's beautiful to reassociate ourselves with these words in new ways. So I love that you, I love that you say religion and that we can start to relate to that mm-hmm. in both old and new ways. Yeah, I think one of the problems that I've run into is that there is this mindset that here's religion and they automatically go to uh, religious organizations and dogma. And uh, And oppression and patriarchy. yeah, Yeah, yeah. And they do the same thing with spirituality often is they just equate spirituality with religious dogma. And so there's a, you know, I don't want to use the language of violence, but there is a fight to be had to reclaim um, this idea of spirituality and say, no, it's not part of, you know, Mm -hmm. this bigger, you know, uh, these earth dishonoring traditions, if you will. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting for me to think about when we say they, what do we mean? Because I really think the more I go into a deeper experience, oh, I hate the word. I'm so frustrated with the Western language, but I was going to say the experience of vibrational reality Yeah, yeah. or the interwoven stories. There's so many ways I try to say that, but Mm -hmm. uh, there's these thought forms and we feed them and they take on a life of their own. And sometimes I think when we're saying they, it has to do with these thought forms that have taken on really an essence of their own. I know exactly what you mean. I just find it really interesting to dig into what do we mean when they say they, because that they is in us and we do that to ourselves simultaneously. So I find it very interesting and complicated. And yeah. Yeah. And that may be a different conversation, but it's something that I think about quite a bit in terms of the thought forms Mm -hmm. um, that we're giving power to these ideas and that they take on a life of their own. And I I know in the, in some of the Western occult traditions, they refer to these as egregores. um, And I don't know much about them, but um, I I often feel that, and this is just the image that I get in my imagination is that we have given birth to this. I I don't know. I, I imagine it as like this giant, gigantic grub uh, clinging <laughs> to the clinging to the planet, and it's just they're yeah. pulsating mm-hmm. and feeding off of the natural resources and human misery, and uh, that's just how I imagine it. And uh, I, I want to get rid of that grub. <laughs> and we're we're contributing to it, uh, and this is very much related to my book. We contribute. We we are contributing to it by the ways in which we are. Mm, 
complicit in those belief structures. Right. And yet they're impacting us and coming at us so much. I talk about this in my book. It requires such a profound amount of mindfulness Mm -hmm. to really allow ourselves to live in the new story, as Thomas Ferry would say, and Charles Eisenstein. Yeah. Yeah. A grub. I like that. Yeah, yeah, it's just just the image that came to me. I mean, if I don't use that language, I allow my Gnostic turpitude to kick in, and I, um, you know, start complaining about the uh, demiurge and his archons. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, and maybe that is. And that's crowd. that. I love that because I haven't studied that so much, and I yeah. love your language. But I, lately, I do often go back to Jung's Red Book. Yeah. yeah. Because it helps me sort out so much my own experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he talks about the spirits of our time. Mm-hmm. And then also my, my shamanic mentor talks about time spirits mm-hmm. and it's, it's very similar. I think we know what we're talking about, but then again, we're getting to something and we're trying to unpack something that there's not a lot of structure in our, in the Western worldview to understand. Right. Right. Exactly. Right. So uh, let's dig in a little bit and maybe the place to start here. Uh, because I do have a lot of questions, but let's, let, let's look at that mindfulness because I think that your work, I hope I'm correct in this. It begins with just connecting to the land in which you live, the place mm-hmm. where you are. And you wrote that um, at one time you wrote, you know, just to go and do nothing in nature. And it seems to me that that's the beginning, but it also seems like it's not just doing nothing, but it's actually like mindfulness in the Buddhist practice to be aware of what's going on. Uh, Is that correct? So this is an interesting point you're bringing up because I I do practice meditation as you read my book and I have uh, since my early twenties, almost 30 years ago, 30 years ago. Okay. Let's just say it 30 years ago. I'm with you. I know I turned 50. So <laughs> I definitely, I think over the years and the more I work with students, uh, the more I realize I always have that base of presence that I've through meditation hmm. when I, but there is a difference between meditating in nature and doing contemplative practice and doing nothing. And I've really learned over time how to differentiate that. Okay. And, and I think a huge part for us of being able to sit and be and listen and hear is to give our minds, our chattery Western minds, something to do. And then we start having these sensations that don't fit into our worldview. And our minds are saying, that's not real. How can that be real? Oh my gosh, that can't happen. Why is that? Why am I feeling that? So I really do think having a mindfulness practice and being able to watch our sensations and our reactions and our belief structures pop up is really important. And I do also really value now. And I actually started getting this, believe it or not, in my philosophical education, Charles Peirce, who's an early American philosopher. I don't know if you know him. He has this wonderful essay about just completely letting the mind open. And that if you sit there long enough with the, with the mind open, you will find the divine. And I wrote on him a lot when I was getting my master's degree. And I do think there is a difference between sitting and doing nothing and doing mindfulness practices. Although I do honestly think for myself, doing a lot of years of mindfulness helps me sit there and do nothing. Mm. Because when I work with people, I'm really just all of the ecotherapy practices, particularly the ecotherapy practices are giving people's minds something to do so that their bodies can begin to re-experience. And Michael Cohen calls it our, our natural senses. We, so our bodies can relax into the web of life and start to feel what that feels like. For anyone who may not be familiar, can you just uh, give a brief kind of definition or explanation of what you mean by ecotherapy? Uh, you may be finding I don't, I'm not good at brief <laughs> explanations. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's be brief. Ecotherapy grew out of ecopsychology. And again, ecopsychology came from this eco spiritual tradition that you and I were talking about earlier. I'm really trying to be brief here, Nick. Oh, okay. uh, ecotherapy actually emerged when more contemporary psychologists took on these ideas and tried to make them fit more of a traditional contemporary psychological model. 
And so I'm using ecotherapy a little bit differently than people would, because I'm really sticking to this tradition of it coming from, from eco-spirituality. So ecotherapy has a broad range of definitions having to do with um, how being in nature heals us. And there's all kinds of different rundowns and aspects. I really, for me, it has to do with mindfulness and experiencing the earth is sacred and using a lot of contemplative practices. So when I'm saying ecotherapy, I'm doing what is actually traditionally more the center of it, but now would seem like the, the outer edge of it. Okay. And if I ever ask for a brief definition, go as long as you need to. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that there's so many. Yeah, yeah. I do my best. That yeah. was brief, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it seems like in this work, and it's something that I come up against as well, is the issue of language. Uh, you know, you refer to eco-spirituality, and that's a term that I use quite a bit, but I always find it to be kind of clunky in a, in a way. And mm -hmm. I always want to find a better terminology for it. And the closest I can get is like pagan, but that's such a loaded term, mm -hmm. uh, especially since uh, it now seems to be equated with practices like Wicca and whatnot. Um, and I want to expand it beyond that uh, to something else. And I don't know what the term is. So right now I think eco-spirituality may be the best. Uh, I don't know. I think it's hard. My friend Harriet Sams, who is a contemporary druid and ecotherapist, and she does a lot of sacred work with prehistoric sites. She uses the word animism a lot. And I find in the UK... Uh, what we might think of as shamanic practitioners, but they sometimes call themselves that, sometimes druids, use animism. And I really like that. Mm -hmm. But part of the thing that we're dealing with is we're, we're, we're trying to create a new language and we're trying to carve out and grow something and plant seeds of a new kind of way of being. And we're stuck with these words and this language that, that have all these hot points. Mm -hmm. So that's, and I know eventually we might get to the discussion of shamanism and that word. And yeah. it's, really, I find it really, really hard because I say, oh, I'm a pagan and I'm raising my children as a pagan. And a lot of people do equate that with Wicca. And I don't mean that at all. Right. Yeah, I, I'm very similar. Um, and, you know, I just kind of say, well, nature is my religion. I've taken to... Um, I keep my Fridays open because one of the things that's very important to me, and I think it's important to you as well, is to go and be in nature. And mm -hmm. so about 10 or 12 years ago, I made the intention that I was going to begin hiking and I hike the same trail every week. I go into um, a canyon nearby. It's right by NASA's JPNL. Um, and I wanted to get to know that place. And I, I refer to it as my Friday office uh, and that's what it's become known. And most of my friends, you know, understand when I say, yes, I'm going to the Friday office. Um, but I often will tell people like when I'm trying to schedule things, I keep Friday open for my spiritual practice. And that's my spiritual practice uh, mm -hmm. is that hike um, and being there and trying to listen and to observe and to get to know it as best as I can. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Story of my life. Yeah. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit, if you don't mind uh, about the land where you live, you know, what, what's your Friday office? <sighs> so I, there is, I tend the land where I live, right where I live, where my home is. And nurture my relationships here and honor the earth beings here as much as I can. I have a particular place that I go to called Sulphur Springs. It's a beautiful spring in the Chagrin River watershed and it feeds right into the Chagrin River. And I started meditating there about, well, 1997. And over time, I've grown a relationship with that place and it's just deepened and deepened. And then I started teaching there and seeing people there. And it just, it, it's, this is my sacred place and I'm tending to that place. And the more people I bring there and the more things we have there and circles and fire circles and singing, just being together in this, this really beautiful ancient way, the more, I mean, we're waking up 
And I also feel more and more over time, the nature beings, they're becoming more responsive. So I don't know how much of that is just me and us shifting. I, I can't tell, mm -hmm. but that that's a piece of land that I, I nurture very actively and do a lot of tending and teaching healing work there. Okay. Um, when you mentioned the nature beings, uh, what does that mean? Uh, so nature beings, it means so many things on so many different levels, but I'll just start right at the basics, which is the beings that live there, the trees and the animals and the creeks and the stones. And there's the hawks that live in this particular area that like to fly around a lot. And if you hang out and sit quietly long enough, maybe a few hours or a whole day, they'll come fly right by you and spin around you the all of the beings of nature that are there okay all right um you write in the book about um vibrations uh and this like vibratory kind of reality i was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit um i'm glad you asked that <laughs> because i've really been thinking about that lately and again it comes down to language and i find it really interesting that when we talk about this uh, here I am stuck with words, this spiritual aspect of reality, the vibrational matrix, Joanna Macy calls it Indra's web. We talk a lot about the life web. We do tend to come back to these scientific terms and quantum physics has come to this energetic realm. And I tend to think of it as the quantum matrix. And um, David Bohm might call it the holotropic underlying reality. I, I'm really getting frustrated with the word vibration lately. Mm. And so lately I've been thinking about it's the coming together of the stories and the songs of all of the beings. It's the intersection of the relationships. And I was thinking this morning, I didn't know what might come up because we've both gone to CIIS and the beautiful history there, but I was thinking about Owen Barfield saving the appearances. Have you read that book? Uh, no, I've not. It's a phenomenal book. And it was written a very long time ago in the early 1900s, but I first got from that book, this idea that for Western people, we think of the real world and the spiritual world, but for earth-based, I'm not gonna use the hot button word indigenous, hmm. earth-based cultures don't separate it. They experience it simultaneously. So as I go further and further into my practice, I don't experience such a separation anymore before what we what we think of as real between what we think of as real and what we think of as vibrational or spiritual they're blending together so i'm i'm beginning to experience it's not like stepping from one to the other like it used to be it's it's starting to become my my experience and i i really want that for everybody it's such yeah. a beautiful way of being in relationship. I'm sure you have some of that from going, once you start going out in nature all the time, it begins to open up. I'm sure you have experiences like that. Yeah. I'm well, assuming. <laughs> uh, no, I do. And it, uh, you know, I, I've noticed a change in myself and a change in the way I relate to some of the nature beings where I am, because, you know, I'm in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And so this is a desert like area and I'm hiking inside a canyon. Uh, I've noticed a profound change in my relationship to rattlesnakes. Mm. Um, I used to be a person who, you know, the best snake is a dead snake. Mm -hmm. um, but I discovered I started feeling empathy for them mm -hmm. and started developing a profound respect for them and notice this change of consciousness and this change mm -hmm. of being. Um, and this year I've hardly seen any of them and I miss them. I'm like, where are all the snakes? Where are the rattlers? Uh, but I wanted to ask, uh, because you had mentioned onomism and this idea, you know, when we're talking about, about the vibrations, are those two connected is, would you also connect the idea of consciousness or mind to this? Well, I would, because I went to the philosophy, cosmology and consciousness yeah. program. Right. <laughs> Uh, would I connect mind? Not in any, you know, is because we share this language, which I know is a little complicated for the listeners. So I want to be careful not to get too much sure. into our shared yeah, yeah, yeah. language, which would be really fun to do. Huh. 
Do I connect mind and consciousness? I do. I think, I think those are terms, if we think of a really expanded sense of a participatory, non-separate self kind of mind, yes, mm -hmm. I think everything has consciousness in the way that I perceive consciousness, which is the, the life force, the beautiful um, Brian Swim, my call it the Eros, mm -hmm. it connects everything. Right. Yeah, I think of it as having consciousness really different than our consciousness and so some people really say oh you're anthropomorphizing right. when you think that this particularly me because i really came to my shamanic awakening through relating to rocks so i say to people oh rocks are very relational and they think that's completely nuts but then as you begin to relate to them in the way i talk about in my book they will tell you a story they will express their experience they do share wisdom and we have our filters right we have our human ways of knowing and being and we filter it through that but yes everything has consciousness yeah yeah well i i wanted to ask because uh, well one uh, one of my oldest and dearest friends uh, we lived together for a while uh, shortly after she first moved to california i've recommended your book to her and she told me that a few others have recommended it to her as well oh good thanks um, and in large part it's because um it, i can see how it definitely speaks to her when you write about uh, spirit guides and especially the rocks uh, because when she lived with me, she just had rocks and crystals and things. And, you know, she would communicate with them. Mm -hmm. And she said that, you know, I would probably am the only person who wouldn't try to have her put away uh, for this part of me, you know, the rational part of me is like, yeah, rocks, there's no consciousness. But if you have a expanded view of what consciousness is and an animistic view, mm -hmm then yeah, it's possible. And I found personally, I've got rocks all over the place that, and from places I visited mm -hmm. uh, that I just naturally take them. And now I feel guilty that I should have asked mm -hmm. uh, before taking them. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but prior to that, I, I would just take them because it's like, oh yes, this is, um, it spoke to me somehow. Maybe yeah, it told me to take me take them or something. I don't, I'm not we sure do that. these things unconsciously, and they're really it's really in our DNA to yeah. enact these kinds of rituals mm -hmm. and relationships. And I I have so many people that will become my students or work with me in some way, and they'll go. Oh, that's why I have rocks all over my house. They don't know why they're doing it. Right. We're just doing it. Right. Yeah, and that's something I really appreciated about your work because it seems to me that it's you know, you go out into the nature and you do nothing and all of this will just arise naturally, uh, it seems. Yeah, there is the do nothing part, but then I think there is also a lot of relating through ritual and ceremony. Yeah, I've, right. In my book, I talk about it a lot as ritual. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And as I've gotten more deeply into shamanic practice, I think of it more as ceremony. And okay. that's, you know, that's a differentiation that we can spend time on or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there is this sitting there doing nothing. And then what I experienced is I would, ex I would come into this co-creative mm -hmm. being taught by the earth and invited and directed to start doing things. And the first thing was making circles with rocks, mandalas. And I had done, I studied young and my undergraduate work a lot. And I don't, I've always done a lot of work with mandalas and I just started making circles with rocks and I've learned so much over time about the divine symbol that circles are in so many cultures, religions, spiritualities use them. And it was really working with circles. Somehow it, it, it opened this aspect of me, not the rational part. We could spend a lot of time on that. The limits of what we can know with our rational minds I started really learning through creating mandalas and working with them more and more deeply. Now, are these uh, temporary mandalas? Uh, is it a, uh, are, are, you know, is it like a small mandala? Is it a large mandala? Is it permanent, temporary? I work with all of the above, small, okay. large, permanent. I wouldn't say permanent, nothing in nature is permanent, but That's I certainly true. have worked with circles, sacred circles, of rocks over many, many, many years. I have one behind my house I've worked with for eight okay. years now. All right. And I've had really 
Oh, I'm going to say my most profound openings. And in fact, I had what I think of as my shamanic awakening, spontaneous shamanic awakening. I had no idea what it was. Where the, the veils just thinned and I was able to, in that moment, see backward and forward in time and see body memories of the earth. And I was seeing beings crossing that had lived there where I was in the past and feeling helping spirits. And I really, really believe that working with circles creates portals, particularly with rocks, because I do back to the word vibrational. I'll just use that as a shortcut. I do feel that they hold a wisdom of the original dreaming of the earth Mm. and that they can create this place, sort of a protective space that we can be in outside of time and space and outside of the bombardment of the belief structures of our techno industrial culture. And that we find a place there where we're able to really rest and come into our hearts and then things open up and we see things and experience things. I think of them as portals. Mm. And then I also make small mandalas. I use them a lot in my healing work with people. I find them to be phenomenally powerful. Yeah. I would imagine that they would be. You give a lot of practices in the book. Um, in fact, that's mostly uh, what your book is are all these practices. And, um, and again, I like that there's this sort of looseness uh, to them, I think, uh, which allows people room to explore mm -hmm. and modify them, uh, kind of make them their own. Um, so I was wondering, you, you also, uh, it, it, your work, this earth spirit dreaming is a method. And uh, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about the method. Okay. So I'll give a little background because I was teaching environmental philosophy and I was teaching environmental ethics. And a lot of times these were students, there's a lot of nursing students where I was teaching or just, they were getting a general undergraduate degree. And so they were taking philosophy as an upper level course uh, as part of their humanities collection. So they were coming to me, not so much knowing about philosophy for a lot of them. It was their first philosophy class and their first introduction to any sort of environmental awareness. So what I learned pretty quickly is teaching about everything that's awful about the environment completely shut everybody down. And I was really thinking about how do we develop an earth ethic, which to me has to do with realizing, I'm so Joanna Macy here, that we are part of the earth. And I started using, I left the books behind and we went out into the woods behind the college. And I started having people sitting in this big mandala. I had them as a community create them. I mean, these are people that never had experienced anything like this. And it, they just, they would be in the woods and it felt so natural. And then when they stepped out, they felt completely different. And they gradually just came to really love the earth. And this is what inspired them. And over time, I actually did a qualitative study. Once I figured out and started watching how these sensitivities were developing, uh, I would do this earth grounding work. And then because I was at Ursula, which was really supportive of a holistic approach, and I certainly was allowed and even encouraged to work with spiritual elements, I would start talking about the sacredness of the earth and being with the earth is sacred and bringing in those kinds of readings. And I really saw an evolution happening. And then I was working with some ways of how do we vision in the classroom? Like what's your, the, the world that you would love to see really go as far as you can imagine way beyond what we think is possible right now. And I started seeing this process developing. And then when I left the college, because I was ready to just be outside all the time, sitting, I say to people, I was up in my sacred circle and I realized my job was to call people together to sit in circles of rocks. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. So I started the Institute. And as I was doing this more like your Institute, as I was doing this more and more outside, I really started seeing that whether it was, whether I had two hours or whether I had a weekend or whether I had 10 months, these snap steps of earth connecting and then learning to work spiritually and with the spirits of the land and in vibrational reality. And then when we're really aligned with our true humanity and all that we can really be and know when we're integrated with the web of life, when we start imagining and dreaming from that space, 
then we're really separated. We're really, we're really free in some way from the time spirits. And you used another word, which was so cool. I'll have to go back to that. You and I were talking about earlier, because if we're, if we're imagining from the same place, and we've all heard this a lot of times, if we're imagining and dreaming and creating from the same place that got us to the mess we're in, we're just creating more of the mess. So the earth and spirit grounding is really a way to get ourselves oriented into dreaming with the earth. Yeah. And I like that you uh, say that in the book that, you know, this process is going to be very messy and very muddy um, because we're just kind of stumbling through. Uh, I, I, I also, I'm a little bit jealous uh, because I, you know, I teach at the community college level mm -hmm. and I try to bring in as much as I can, some of this material but I'm very limited in how I do it. I don't think that they would invite me back to teach again if I went out. And there actually isn't really any place for us to go uh, mm -hmm. near the campuses I teach. But it's so crucial. I often think that, you know, if we don't address this material for the students, we're doing them a great disservice. We are. And, and so it's something that I'm constantly reflecting on, you know, how do we go about doing this? Do we Without have getting to go? Fired. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> do, do we, you know, I teach, you know, one of the colleges I teach at is considered one of the top 10 community colleges in the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's in the top five and they don't even have an environmental ethics course. And I think that's just scandalous. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and, you know, one of the questions that I ask is, you know, do we have to go outside of traditional academia? I mean, we kind of did for our doctoral program, mm -hmm. but how are we going to, you know, in order to save the world and save ourselves, this is vital education. These are vital experiences. Well, I have an interesting story and I'm not going to say the name, but I have a current student who was getting a degree at a very well recognized college nearby. I, I, I don't want to uh, give away details mm -hmm. of his personal experience, but he happened to find my book. He was getting a degree in counseling there, master's. And he went and fought with his advisors. He said, I am going to work with this book and I want to, I want to, I want to do an independent study and his courage to stick up to them and the amount of, of, I mean, I don't know what else to call it other than just fight and tenacity. It is really hard to get these kinds of ideas into the ivory tower. Yeah. And I remember when I wanted to go to CIIS, my advisor and my master's of philosophy, you know, my philosophy program, he said, if you choose this college, it will ruin your career. Mm. Well, it ended up making my career. Mm. And the way that was right for me. I think that's a really complicated and interesting question. And I also am really curious what you're teaching. I did find ways to bring some little things in and students were there. People are starved mm -hmm. for ritual and connection yeah. and sacred. Yeah. I don't really incorporate any ritual uh, <laughs> into the courses. What are you teaching? Uh, mostly I teach, uh, I teach the, uh, what's essentially a world religion class. Mm -hmm. And I do approach, I have students discuss uh, like with uh, Taoism, uh, the role of Taoism and you know, nature. Uh, I cover the uh, goddess traditions and uh, we kind of look at the issues there as well. I will often bring in uh, uh, Lynn White Jr.'s article, uh, essay, uh, The Roots of the Environmental Crisis. Yes. Uh, so we can have a discussion on the role of uh, the uh, story of Genesis. Uh, mm -hmm. That's about the extent in the religion courses. Um, I, I'm rethinking them a little bit. I often also teach, uh, when I teach logic, uh, that's just pure logic. So there's no room for logic any Logic is it. logic. Yeah. <laughs> It's uh, own kind of ritual. Yeah. Uh, when I teach critical thinking, I do always incorporate a um, environmental aspect to it. Mm -hmm. uh, students have to work together in groups to do a final presentation. And uh, one of the topics, they always have to look at issues. And I 
take a more democratic approach at the very beginning of class where I ask the students, you know, what's of concern to you? And we end up voting and getting it down to about five different issues. But mm -hmm. one, I always, you know, climate change, that's number one, you know, there's always going to be a group that does climate change. When I teach philosophy, I do incorporate that. I have done it and I thought, well, if anyone finds out and they don't like it, they can just get rid of me. Mm -hmm. um, but throughout the introduction to philosophy class, there's an environmental um, component to it. Uh, the way I describe it to students is that uh, we're hanging our hats on the environment. So we're going to explore all of these different philosophers and philosophies through the lens of, um, of the environment. And what I do to start with is there's an essay um, uh, by um, Orr, I think it is. Um, David Orr. Yeah, David Orr. Uh, what, what is education for? Mm -hmm. I love and, that. And he flat out says that, you know, all education ought to be environmental education. Mm -hmm. And that's where we begin. Uh, you know, these myths of education and uh, what education should be for. And I, I don't think students have ever been asked, what is the purpose of your education? I think David Orr should be safe because he's a very well-respected yeah. Yeah. professor at Oberlin. Actually, yeah. you know, yeah. you lived yeah. in Ohio, so you yeah. know it's right nearby. Yeah. And he worked with Barack Obama and mm -hmm. I think you're safe there, Nick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're if you're gonna get kicked out for David Orr, then you know I think he's. But that's a great choice because he really is a wonderful gateway. Mm -hmm. I think of him as a gateway thinker to visionary yeah. environmental thought. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I keep pushing every now and then, trying to get people to say, you know, we have to start addressing this. And, Where at the uh, college? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the schools I teach at does have an environmental ethics course, but I've never had the opportunity to teach it. And uh, mm -hmm. so I, I know that some schools do. I know that some schools do. I recently discovered that the, uh, I think it's West Los Angeles College mm -hmm. uh, actually offers a associate's degree in climate change studies, uh, which I think is crucial and important. Nick, you need more places to express your soul calling and your, your deep yeah. earth intelligence. Well, yes. And that's part of why I'm doing this podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, beautiful. Yeah. First steps out, first steps out. Uh, too much about me, too much about me. Uh, let me ask you, this is the big question. We, we discussed this a little bit before I hit record. Um, uh, but, <laughs> I know, uh, but let's talk about this. Um, this terminology, uh, shamanism. Uh, let's start there. Okay. Um, and then we're going to move on to re-indigenizing, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So as I say in the book, I really struggled with this term and I did not study shamanism. I did not read about shamanism. This was a term that I chose retroactively because I realized that I was going into trance states and shamanism means people that go into trans states to move in the spirit world and do work in that world. And that's what started evolving for me. And I have to say, I also was born with a lot of spiritual awareness. I was born very clairvoyant. I saw lots of spirits as a child, and then I shut that down. And so it was already there as a seed in me. And then when I was really connecting to the earth, it came up again, in a, I think a much more grounded, healthier way, because I was really in this deep relationship to the earth. I'm not avoiding the word shamanism. Yeah. And I know a lot of people are very concerned about cultural appropriation. And I personally am aware of a lot of ugliness, um, some of it from a longing to have rituals and earth-based rituals. And some of it, you know, I don't want to rain on anybody else's parade, um, but there's certainly been, you know, a capitalist aspect to taking rituals from indigenous people that are very attractive for lots of reasons. I mean, we have a true and deep longing as Westerners. We're separated from who we really are in an embodied way. And I know that even now, and I think a lot in the 70s and 80s in the beginning of the New Age movement, a lot of people were taking on and practicing Native American and other indigenous traditions outside of the cultural context and calling it shamanism. So I think people equate shamanism sometimes and with this appropriation. But as far as I know, there aren't indigenous people in the Americas that, that refer to themselves as shamans, maybe medicine people in other terms. 
it derives from Siberia. Uh, so, you know, that's a really touchy term for me, but I feel like also I spent a lot of time thinking about it and it's a way to let people know it's a signifier for what I do, this other aspect of my work that has to do with trans work and interacting with helping spirits and doing certain kinds of healing. Uh, and that's the most common term. And lately I've been thinking, cause I struggle with it a lot. You know, and I think, oh, should I change the term? And then I'm like, well, that's what we have right now. And I thought, well, there's a lot of therapists and we know there's bad therapists and there's a lot of shamanic practitioners and we know there's bad shamanic practitioners and that's life. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do feel a lot of conflict around pain that it's causing mm -hmm. for people that might think or assume I'm appropriating. But as you know, from my book and my own experience, uh, and now we're on to re-indigenizing. I really think that when we deeply connect with the earth, there's sort of these natural ways of being that emerge in earth-based spirituality that look indigenous. Mm -hmm. They look, the only other places we may have seen them is in indigenous cultures and they, they don't really have a place in Western culture. Although there is actually a lot of it in our traditional religions and we just don't see it that way. Yeah. Yeah. How so? Well, I, I grew up Christian. Uh, both of my parents are Episcopal priests and my dad has a beautiful, beautiful, I really learned from him this beautiful, pure love, Christ consciousness, which really has influenced me. I learned a beautiful spirituality from him. Um, and then I ended up marrying into a Jewish family. So I was going to a lot of Jewish services and I was like, this is so indigenous, the things that they do and the way that they're chanting and singing and blowing the ram's horn and wrapping their arms with leather. And it's all, it's on a lunar calendar and the kinds of rituals they do just seems incredibly indigenous and earth-based to me, maybe from coming from Christianity into Judaism. And it's, it's so seemed to fit with my own eco-spiritual approach that I decided to raise my children Jewish because I just thought it fit with really raising them strongly with an earth connected sense of belonging and spirituality. Yeah. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you said all of that. It's something that I've often thought about that term shamanism, because I know it's a, con uh, a contested term and some scholars now are saying, no, you can only use it in regards to the Siberian people who actually practice this. Um, but it's become such a uh, well-known term and <laughs> I don't know what other term we can use uh, at this point. Yeah. And yes. And the, the Siberian quote unquote shamans don't call themselves that it was the anthropologist that came up with right. that word. Right. White, white people created the word. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting to look more deeply into it and it's become a global signifier. I mean, there's mm -hmm. lots of words that we use from different languages um, that come to mean something. Right. And, you know, it is something I do teach in all of my religious studies classes. I actually begin with the shamanic because from my perspective, it is the core, I think, uh, the primary religious impulse, um, uh, I do for too. humans, you know, mm -hmm. I think that, I, I think the argument that the uh, Paleolithic caves, um, that there was shamanic activity in there, I think that's a sound argument. Mm -hmm. What I've noticed is that that is probably the section in my courses that students respond to most, that they always want to know. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many times students have asked me, how can I go about finding a legitimate shaman? It's really hard to find a legitimate shaman. And then what do, how do we, in a Western context, legitimize that? Yeah. It's, it's really complicated. And as I say in my book, Western people typically want to take a lot of shortcuts to these kinds of practices mm -hmm. and experience. And it's a decades long commitment mm -hmm. and an everyday commitment to relate to the earth and relate to the spirits. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's, it's become my life. Yeah. And that's kind of what I tell them. I say, you know, instead of finding a shaman, go out into nature or 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, listen to this drumming. <laughs> also, yeah. I would never call myself a shaman. I'll right. tell you that right now. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like a baby in diapers mm -hmm. compared to people that grew up in cultures that support these ways of knowing. I feel mm -hmm. as Westerners, we're just beginning to step across the threshold. Mm -hmm. Uh, I do call it shamanic practices because that indicates to people that if they come to me, we're going to be working with trance right. and with helping spirits. Right. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting situation that it's like, we have to remember where we came from. You know, we, we have forgotten so much. And I think it's interesting that you find or found much in the Jewish tradition that kind of nourish that. And it's something that I've been looking for in um, the other traditions to try to find these lineages um, that you can like direct people to and say, aha, look right there, right there. Uh, I'm going to recommend a book, Nick. Okay. This Sacred Earth. Hmm. It's a collection by Roger Gottlieb. He is a well-respected in the Academy environmental and environmental justice spiritual ecology mm -hmm. author, this sacred earth. He has a beautiful collection from all different religions that show how many of these different religions relate to nature in different ways. Yeah. yeah. You'll love it. Yeah. Well, I, I've, I've explored some of it, but uh, you know, I, I, I'm looking at the, 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 the threads of what we're referring to as the shamanic activity mm -hmm. um, because it's interesting that you find evidence for it pretty much everywhere, except in the Abrahamic traditions. Uh, but it's there if you But look. it's totally in the Bible or the Torah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Moses encountered a burning bush. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I think you can talk make... about going to the ancestors. And yeah. I mean, it's yeah. all in there. Yeah. But um, people say, oh, that's a funny myth. Yeah, yeah. That's in it. Why did we tell that story? Yeah. Well, I think it's there in, uh, in the prophets. Uh, I think the prophets are engaged in Definitely. kind of shamanic activity. And, and the I think you can, the spirit. Yeah. And I think that you can say the same for Jesus. I mean, he's going around healing mm -hmm. and that's the main function of a shaman, isn't it? Or there's one of the a, primary there's functions? This secret, there's this secret among, of, I would say, a large collection of shamanic practitioners that I happen to know that that have a relationship with Jesus and the Christ consciousness and everybody sort of keeps it a secret, like it's not cool. And um, that element is very much there. As soon as you cross over into across the veils into the spirit realms around our planet, the Christ is there as a very close companion and guide mm -hmm. and very active. So I find it interesting. You brought that up because I've been talking to some friends like, we should really come out with this, like Jesus and shamanism. Wow, that would yeah. break the internet. Anyway, our little tiny corner of the internet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a little like secret. Yes, it's yeah. so true what you're saying. I really appreciate you brought that up. Yeah, well, the, the places that I have found it recently has been in the esoteric hermetic traditions, mm -hmm. um, especially with, you know, I, I've started been uh, started looking at things like these uh, medieval grimoires and they have these they're creating mandalas and they're contacting spirits <laughs> and it's like hey send me shamanism. some resources i want to read it nick yeah that that um, would be very supportive for me yeah okay i will do that i will do that uh but it also takes me back to something that we said earlier is that it seems like something shut this off and kind of buried it and hid it. Um, and it's this energy that seems to be blocking us um, and that we have yeah, to it's called the push enlightenment. against it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which brought so many beautiful things. Yeah. And yeah. this is exactly what Brian Swim and Thomas Berry say. Um, and just the evolution of consciousness. Let's go back to Rick Tarnas, the passion yeah. of the Western mind. He talks right. so beautifully about what the enlightenment brought and how important it is. Right. And yet something was broken off there. Yeah. We amputated something mm -hmm. and it left us really empty. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I agree with that. Um, absolutely. Which is why I ended up in the doctoral program that I did. <laughs> we both did. We're sort of, this is a bit turning into an advertisement, yeah. California Institute of Ventricle Studies. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm mindful of this when I speak to people because 
we often have, and we've been trying to avoid this, there is a language that you learn at the school. And I want to make my podcast accessible to everyone. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, I'm always kind of hesitant in a sense to speak with uh, fellow graduates because I'm like, let's bring it down. And let's I think we're doing language. pretty well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, use a language that everyone can um, uh, understand. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask, uh, let me, I know we're starting to run out of time here, uh, but how can people who live in cities, mm -hmm. um, be it like Cleveland, Los Angeles, New York, Denver, Chicago, how can they engage in these practices? I've thought a lot about that because when I was teaching at Ursuline, um, I taught a graduate eco-psychology course to art therapists. They have a graduate art therapy program, and a lot of them are working with families in the inner city. And I'm just going to preface this by saying I think green space should be a basic human right mm. because of the psychological impacts of not having access to green space. Uh, but for people that live in cities, I think just growing plants is really helpful. I also think developing a day, daily relationship with any nature being that's in, outside or inside, you can have a plant and bring rocks inside. I tell people to bring things from nature inside. You can work with them, putting them on your body and making mandalas. But I think it's wonderful to create a relationship with a nature being. You and I talk about returning to the same place over and over and over again and what that does for us and how that shifts our awareness and our sensations and our consciousness. And I think just make a friend, make friends with a tree on the way to work. And just notice, stop to notice, just take a breath and notice a nature being there all over and really consistently do it. To me, it's all about daily practice. And maybe this goes back to practicing Buddhism and daily meditation. But to me, these daily practices is how we begin to see shifts. And then we watch these nature beings and how they shift through the seasons. I think it's harder in cities. Yeah. I really do. Yeah. And I think part of the problem perhaps is that, especially in cities, there is this tendency for many people to see a separation, uh, mm -hmm. you know, culture, nature. And I see this in the student with my students all the time. And I'm always reminding them, you're always in nature, mm -hmm. you know, that weed growing out of the crack in the sidewalk, that's nature. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that's one of the first steps is once you can do that, then you can start uh, and maybe, you know, seeing the tree and paying attention to the tree is going to help, you know, uh, instill that idea. Um, yeah. And I'm, I love eco environmental eco phenomenologists. There's a great essay called what is eco phenomenology, where he talks about not separating humans from nature. We are nature. We definitely create that dichotomy. Yeah. yeah and that's, sure. that's a problem. That's a brokenness there. We are nature. Yeah. All right. So I wanted to ask you this. The situation often seems pretty dire, the environmental situation that we're uh, facing. And I applaud you on the work you're doing. I think that's necessary. But I wanted to ask you, what gives you hope? What gives me hope? Well, I will say I did environmental activism starting in the 1980s. And I ended my career in that kind of activism, doing a lot of work in scholarship and fracking. And I got what I called frack back because it was just so painful and distressing to me. And Joanna Macy talks about pain for the world and our grief and how important that is. And I, I had to give up that kind of direct action activism because it was just, I couldn't, I couldn't physically, mentally, psychologically tolerate it anymore. And I switched to what I think of as spiritual activism, which is creating a culture of seeing the earth as sacred. And people say to me, well, how's that gonna fix climate change? Well, we need to heal ourselves. We need to heal ourselves as humans and heal our relationship with the earth. And I have my little tiny spot in the forest where I'm doing my work. And I think all the different levels of activism are really important for the planet. What gives me hope? What gives me hope? So this started when I was teaching environmental studies it's not in the news. I'm, I'm very hopeful that what I was thinking about 30 years ago is now in the news. I mean, Time Magazine is talking about climate change. To me, that's a miracle from where I started in the 80s when I was in college. Everybody thought I was a nut for recycling back then. So there's huge, huge change. 
And so when I was teaching, what gave me hope is how many people in all these different locations are doing activism for the earth and permaculture and creating these local solutions. And there's a great book, Blessed Unrest by Paul Hawken. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, I've read that. He's been keeping track of these, these millions, really millions of groups and people right where they are connecting with their land and coming up with solutions that gives me tremendous hope really. And I wish that were in the news because I think just thinking about how awful things are, it's important for people to know, but it's also disempowering. I'd like there to be a lot of, I'd like there to be solutions Mm -hmm. in the New York times every day. There are some, but it's few and far between. The other thing that gives me hope is, and I'm going to get really spiritual, I'm going to skip the word shamanic, is how many people there are that are reconnecting with these ancient ways of allowing these supportive beings that exist around our planet, our ancestors, I connect with what I would call planetary light guides, these these guides and these conscious beings in the web of life and the cosmos that are here to help us. And we're opening again, the dominant culture, Western culture, that's really the primary problem right now, there's all these pockets of people opening again to this kind of guidance. Mm -hmm. And it it gives me tremendous hope when I see people around a fire together, grieving and telling stories and connecting with the ancestors and singing and celebrating the earth. It feels so ancient and real and true and beautiful to me. It just, it it gives me incredible joy. Uh, uh, Very nice answer. And I agree with that uh, completely. Uh, it's in community and um, and in nature. That's where we're going to find our healing. And I liked your comment, and you say this in the book too, that we can't heal the earth without healing ourselves first. We're the, we're the problem. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if we heal ourselves, the earth is healed. I say, I talk about healing the earth, but it really has to do with healing our relationship to the earth. All right. Yeah. All right. For sure. For sure. So uh, what's next for you? I have absolutely no idea. Okay. That's not true. I have some <laughs> ideas, but I am, I am particularly, I'm giving myself a fall fallow period because I, I, I feel like I'm a, completing a cycle of things I wanted to do for the last 25 years. So I'm in a, I'm in an opening period. Okay. I do teach trainings in shamanic ecotherapy and I work with a lot of students and I'm doing an advanced facilitator training right now. And those are ongoing. Um, I think what's next is another book. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Brewing. So we'll see. Okay. Um, can I plug my website? Yes, please. I was going to ask you where uh, people can find uh, find out more about you. Shamanicecotherapy.com. And I have ongoing online trainings and I work with individuals and uh, I really enjoy working with people. Okay, wonderful. I will put a link uh, in the show notes and in the video uh, mm-hmm. description for the website and also links for your book. Great. Thanks so much, so- Nick. All right. Well, thank you. I really appreciated this conversation and I am very grateful for your time today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. All right. Thank you. Take care. And that's a wrap on episode 18 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you are part of my YouTube audience. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive review on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. Your reviews really do help, and please consider subscribing. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. For the time being, I'll be releasing episodes every other week with the goal of releasing them every week in the near future. I'm also working on creating additional video content for the YouTube channel, including book reviews, educational videos on topics concerning spirituality, the history of religion, and the religious response to the climate crisis. If you would like to support my work in creating free and credible material on YouTube, please consider making a one-time donation via PayPal. You can find a link for that in the video description or the show notes. Your support makes this podcast possible. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.